Okay, g'day all, welcome to another CUDA shoot. So this is a really big topic and I originally tried to do a huge shoot with uh, all of the shared memory information and then some coding at the end but it went for way too long so I've decided to split it up into lots of little shoots. Uh, I hope it's better that way. Anyway, the topic that we're talking about is shared memory and as far as CUDA coding goes, this is some of the most interesting uh, information I think anyway. So shared memory is a small, it's some kilobytes in size. It's a small area of very fast memory available to CUDA coders. And it's allocated per block. Uh, all threads in a block share the same shared memory. So it's a little bit strange, but uh, that's how it works. Uh, it's about a hundred times or more faster than going straight to global memory. You know, global memory is really far away sometimes. So shared memory is often a lot faster. And usually any, any shared memory that you can use over global memory should be taken advantage of. Pretty much always when you can use shared memory, you should. Okay, there's a couple of ways to allocate shared memory and we'll go through them here. So there's static allocation of shared memory and there's also dynamic allocation of shared memory. So static is a little bit simpler, we'll go through that first. Uh, in a CUDA kernel, you can use the shared qualifier beside a variable to say that the following variable is uh, shared amongst the threads of the block. And the amount has to be specified at compile time, so it's got to be a compile time constant. Something like this down here. We have uh, double underscore shared, double underscore, and int i would be a shared integer. So every thread in the block is going to have exactly the same variable i, and every block that you run in your grid is going to have a different shared i. Uh, or, if you like, you can also allocate an array of shared memory. So something like double underscore shared, double underscore float, f array 100. But the important thing about this static allocation of shared memory is that the 100 just here, or whatever number it happens to be, has to be a constant, compile time constant. Alrighty, if you're not happy with static shared memory, you can also change the amount of shared memory, but you've got to do it on the host side. Yeah, it's a little bit strange, but the third parameter of the launch configuration is actually the amount of shared memory. Pretty weird. So on the host side, when you call the kernel, you can actually supply a third argument. So we've got 10, 23, and 19 here as the kernel launch parameters. And that 10 just there is the number of blocks. The 23 is the number of threads per block. And the 19 just here is the amount of shared memory to allocate per block in um, bytes. So when you do the allocation of shared memory dynamically like this, you've got to add extern to the declaration of the shared memory in the kernel. So something like extern, double underscore shared, double underscore char, shared buffer, and then just open close brackets and keep your brackets empty. That's going to be read as 19. Yeah, because 19 was the third parameter that I passed in the launch configuration. So this 19 just here in the launch configuration can be a variable. Yeah, that's why it's dynamic, so you can change the amount of shared memory per call to a kernel. Uh, you don't actually put anything in the brackets here, I just put 19 there as an illustration. Okay, so there is a little bit of a problem with this, and that's the, uh, the fact that there's actually only one parameter in the launch configuration which specifies how much shared memory, and you might and you probably will eventually, or sometimes, want more than one array of shared memory, dynamic shared memory that is, per kernel launch. So what you can do is just play around with uh, pointers a little bit. So we might have something like this, uh, extern, double underscore shared, double underscore tar, both buffers, and then the launch configuration would specify the exact size of that both buffers array, but then you can use pointers to um, split that array up however you like. So right here I've got a bit of an example. I've got the first characters in that char array are used as a character array. But then exactly the same buffer you can use you know, later characters or 12 bytes and above as say a floating point array if you want. Uh, yeah, it's just an idea. You can also if you like pass you know, variables to your kernel which specify the start and end of the array if you need to. Yeah, it's up to you. Okay, so on to a little bit about exactly what shared memory is. 
Uh, it's a little bit strange, but shared memory is actually the L1 cache of global memory. So L1 cache and shared memory are the same physical memory on the device. And there's 64K total of this memory that you can split up yourself as a programmer. Uh, the L1 is just a regular automatic cache for global memory, so data is stored in L1 and it's evicted from L1 by the GPU. So once something's evicted from L1, it's actually going to go to L2. But uh, that's completely up to the GPU, like the programmer has no say in that whatsoever. So data that you might really want fast access to might accidentally be evicted by the GPU. And that's not really what you want, which is where shared memory comes into it. So shared memory is, in a sense, um, just a way of completely controlling uh, a portion of the L1 cache. Uh, the programmer gets to decide when data goes in and when data is evicted from shared memory. It's completely in the programmer's hand. So it's really, really interesting. It's, a, it's an interesting way to program. Uh, you're given complete control over a portion of the L1 cache, which is just beautiful. And honestly, I sometimes wish that we could do the same with the CPU, but we can't. Anyway, to set the amount of shared memory versus L1 cache, uh, you've got this special function. This is a host side function, uh, CUDA func set cache config. And you've got a couple of options. So on earlier cards, including the one in this computer, uh, I've got the option of 16K of L1 versus 48K of shared, or I can choose 48K of shared and 16K of L1. I think I said that right. Uh, but what you do is you, you call this CUDA func set cache config, you supply a kernel name, and you also supply an enum, which specifies how much you want of shared and how much you want of L1. So the enum can be one of these values. It can be the default, which is uh, zero, uh, which I think, I'm not sure, but on this on this card, and probably all cards, but I'm not sure, uh, I think it's 48k of shared and 16k of L1 by default. Anyway, you can explicitly specify that you prefer shared, which will give you more shared memory than uh, L1. That'll give you 48k of shared memory and 16k of L1. Or, if you like, you can say that you prefer L1, and then most of the memory will be L1 cache, that will be 48k of L1 and 16k of shared. Or, uh, the other option, if you've got a 700 series graphics card and above, so that's sort of the latest graphics cards, uh, you might say that you prefer equal, and that's going to give you 32k of shared and 32k of L1. So this 64k just here is uh, actually the amount of shared memory per SM, streaming multiprocess. Yeah, so you've actually got more shared memory in the GPU than 64K, but this is how it's split up per block. Uh, anyway, I should say that if you don't have a 700 series or above, and you still choose this uh, 3 as your enum value, then you'll just get the default amount. Yeah, so earlier graphics cards, like Fermi graphics cards and below, uh, you can't actually set it to equal value. And the other thing to be careful of is if you request, say, that you prefer L1, uh, but inside the kernel, you actually request more than your 16K, then the graphics card's just going to say you don't know what you're talking about, and it's going to take the reins, and it's going to give you 48K of shared. So this uh, CUDA func set cache config is actually just a preferred setting. And if the graphics card decides that you don't know what you're on about, it's just going to take it, take over and decide for you. Okay, so what we're really getting into here is shared resources, like shared memory is obviously a shared resource for every thread in the block, and with shared parallel resources, they uh, kind of comes hand in hand hazards. Uh, in particular, what we're talking about is race conditions. Uh, you can use things like mutexes and semaphores, which I think we'll look at a bit later on. Uh, it's an extremely interesting topic, and I'd actually really like to go through mutexes and semaphores for CPU coding as well. Do you know... In all of the toots that I've uploaded, I've said almost nothing about um, programming multiple cores and that sort of thing, but we should get into it because it's amazing. Anyway, when you're coding uh, a GPU, things like mutexes and semaphores tend to have a really big impact on performance, unless you're really, really careful. So they naturally serialize code, like a mutex particularly. You know, it supplies exclusive use of a particular resource. So any threads that are accessing uh, a particular variable that's locked by a mutex, uh, they're going to be completely serialized. So what you're going to end up doing is negating the complete purpose of using a GPU in the first place. 
Uh, yeah, if you're talking about serial code, the CPU will thrash the GPU every time. It's really, really quick at serial code. Anyway, you can use mutexes and semaphores well with the GPU as, as well and still get a good speed increase, but uh, just be careful. So what we're getting into is uh, race conditions. Yeah, race conditions. This is an extremely important topic when you're talking about parallel programming, and we'll see it a lot more. Uh, basically, what we're saying is that the running threads may race for a particular resource. So look at this little example just here, and uh, see if you can figure out what's going to happen. It's pretty strange, but uh, I've got shared int i, and then i equals thread idx dot x. What is that going to do? Do you know? Nobody knows. <laughs> we can't say. It's completely out of our hands. As programmers, this is in the scheduler's hand. Yeah, whatever decides the order of the threads that launch, uh, that is what's going to decide what I eventually gets. So this is called a race condition. It's out of the programmer's hand. What's going to happen here is that each thread in the block is going to come along with its own unique thread ID. It's going to change the variable I to whatever its thread ID is. And uh, whatever the final thread is to change the value of i, well, that's going to be the value. And we don't know. As programmers, we don't know what that's going to be. Could be anything. Anyway, this is called a race condition. Uh, the threads are racing for the variable i, and uh, we don't know what it's going to be set to. This is almost never what you want to do. It's, it's usually a very bad idea, and you've usually got to be very careful to avoid race conditions. So, probably the simplest way to avoid race conditions is uh, this sync threads method here. So this is a kernel method, or a device method. This is called within your kernels, and it does something really, really cool. What it does is uh, it acts as a barrier between threads in a thread block. So all threads in the same block, uh, when they come across sync threads, they're just going to sit there and twiddle their thumbs until every thread is at that point. Yeah, no thread in a block will go past sync threads until all threads of the block reach that point. So we could do something like this. This is just a little example, and uh, rather a pointless example as well. But we could declare a shared integer called i. Uh, we could have all threads set i to 0. It doesn't really matter what order they set it there, since that's the same value. Yeah, some thread's going to come along first and set it to 0, but you know, eventually in the block some thread's going to come along last and set it to 0. But what's going to happen is that every thread in the block, once it sets i to 0, it's going to come down here to the next line on sync threads, and it's going to sit there and twiddle its thumbs until every thread in the block is ready. So once every thread is set i to 0, uh, they'll all come here to sync threads, and once they all reach that point, they'll proceed. And the very next line is if i, sorry, if thread idx dot x double equals 0, then increment i. So that's safe, because only one thread in a block is going to have its index uh, of 0. So only one thread is going to increment i, i is going to become 1. And while that first thread of the block is incrementing i, the other threads are going to fall through here to sync threads. They're going to sit there and wait for that first thread to finish incrementing i. Uh, at which point that thread there will come down to sync threads also, which will mean that all threads in the block have reached that point, and from there they'll all proceed together. Uh, once again, on the very next line, we've got another condition. If the thread idx double equals 1, then increment i. And that's going to do basically exactly the same thing as this previous line, only it's going to be a different thread that increments i. But the important thing to know is that at the end of this sequence of uh, sync threads and incrementing i, uh, we know, as programmers, we know the value of i. We've guaranteed that i is incremented twice. In serial, too, which is also important, so it's going to be slow. Uh, but i will be too. We know that. We've guaranteed it because of these sync threads here. And um, also the fact that only one thread is uh, incrementing i at once. Uh, if we didn't have those sync threads there, uh, we could actually end up with i equal to 0, 1, or 2. It's completely out of our, out of our control. It would be up to the uh, thread scheduler to decide what the value of i is. Anyway, at that point we're going to have a break, and uh, I think next time we're going to go on to a really interesting topic, which is exactly how shared memory is organized. Yeah, it's in banks. It gets pretty crazy, but it's a very interesting topic. So, uh, thanks for listening. See ya.